thank you very much for that introduction. Awesome. Uh, <laughs> all right, everyone. Hi, my name is Julie Grundy. I'm a senior UX designer with Bronto, which is an e-commerce marketing platform recently acquired by Oracle. And I'm here today to talk to you about form design. Woohoo! All right, so why do we care about forms? Forms are the linchpin for all online interactions. They are crucial for conversions. We need forms to generate online revenue. We need them to grow our community. And we need them for social sharing and participation. Could you imagine a marketing plan these days without social media? And let me remind you that there would be no YouTube without the successful completion of a form. All right, so web forms are often the last and most important mile in a long journey. And this is according to Luke Wawarowski, author of Web Form Design and fellow UXer. And this quote rang true for me because I've seen it happen countless times where we don't design the form until the last moment. So I'm here today to encourage you to enthusiastically think about forms early and often in your process. All right, so how much do we think a bad form can cost you? All right, well, it's probably something like priceless, but I'm going to tell you that for Expedia, it was $12 million. They noticed a trend that visitors were coming to the site entering their flight information, their lodging information, clicking buy now, and then not completing the transaction. So what's up with that? Well, it turns out that on their billing screen, they had a form under first name for company. And users were getting confused and putting their bank name in the company field, and then their bank address in the address field. So credit cards were declining because that was not the uh, address of the credit card holder on file, right? So using analytics, they discovered this and immediately removed the form. Once they did, I mean, the form field company. And once they did that, they saw conversions increase overnight and resulted in $12 million more profit that year. All because of a form field. And the thing is, is that we know better. If we follow basic usability guidelines, we know that forms are faster to complete and almost twice as likely to be submitted without errors. This is from a 2014 study from Mergem Seckler. So, how do we do this? All right, well for today, I'm gonna to focus on three guiding principles and then talk about design tactics for each one. First, we wanna reduce cognitive load and make it easy. Secondly, we want to help prevent errors, and we need to make it human. All right, so forms are already going to involve a certain amount of mental processing, right? And we want to reduce the amount of brain power that our site visitors need to have to even complete your form so they can look forward to the thing on the other end, the new shoes arriving, or joining your community, or watching the demo. Now, <laughs> so, Let's talk about labels. Top align your labels. This is good for readability and scannability. Reducing cognitive load also means that we want people to be able to scan the form and to induce feelings of simplicity. And top align labels always result in a faster completion time of your form. A label is, by the way, what's circled in red here. It's the kind of instructions above the text field or input. Um, we also want to make sure that our label is close to the form field itself. And it's important to avoid all caps of your labels because it looks like you're yelling and it's harder for readability. OK. Don't use labels as placeholder text for three reasons. One, people don't remember. Once you click in, your instructions go away. And then you have to click out again. This is making people think harder than they need to. Two, when you get to the form and see and scan it, users are going to think it's already filled out. And three, 
text fields that do not have any words in them actually draw more attention than those that do. And this is according to an eye tracking study from Norman Nielsen Group. So don't use labels as placeholder text. Okay, so we all want to take caution with floating labels as well. So floating label refers to the technique of when you type a, the labels in line and then you type in and it rises above. So this is good if you're concerned about height and it's also good because the label stays consistent with, which is what I like, you know, we're not having people remember. But on the other hand, we still have that same problem of when users get to the form, they're gonna quickly scan it and can assume it's filled out. Also, this, this is, introduces additional questions for people with cognitive and visual impairments. So if you are doing this, it's super important that you check your accessibility contrast ratios. Okay, let's talk about button order. You wanna put your primary action on the right and your secondary action on the left because this follows a linear journey. You also need to make sure you differentiate button styles for primary and secondary actions. Okay, forms aren't all about buttons and labels though, right? Sometimes you have options that people need to choose from. So we know from, uh, we know that users can, people in general, we can cap, like, we can understand about five items at the same time. We can process about five items in our brain. So you, if you have less than six items, you want to display all those choices on the form. This will help reduce your completion times. If you have between six and 25 items, you want to put in a select list or drop down. And if you have over 26 items, use contextual search, which lets the users kind of narrow down in their context to narrow down their options. All right, so it's also important that we show progress. This is especially important in a stepped form and is really good for onboarding. Um, it's a good thing to look out for that your progress bar doesn't also look like navigation though. Just something to remember. Okay, so now let's talk about field validation. It's important, uh, this is really helpful in preventing errors. Field validation means we wanna actually specify the errors in line as the user's typing along, not after they push the submit button. It's also important to have helpful messages. I can tell you that I've had some pushback from different IT professionals, depending on how your form's built, if this is possible, but if you can, always specify error messages in line. And if you can get past secure, your security team, or as Jared said, the guys in the um, silver hats or aluminum hats, uh, sh have a show password link if you can. This is especially helpful for mobile. Okay, so let me tell you a quick story. My friend Missy is a, a social worker in DC who helps people on disability get back to work after they've been on leave. So she was with a client and they were working on filling out an online application for her client to work at the local grocery store, which had recently undergone a redesign. She's filling out the form, helping him out, and they get to the end and he's already kind of sweating and asking her if, he thinks, if she thinks that he's ready for this. She says, yes, of course, they push submit and nothing happens. Push submit again, nothing happens. So she scrolls at the top of the page, sees the error message about, form, uh, about the state field. She's like, what, I typed in VA, that's Virginia. So she goes in and then types Virginia in the state field, pushes submit, and once again, nothing happens. So they give up. And the client leaves feeling defeated and mentioned that he wasn't smart enough to work there. Y'all, this is all because of a form field. And I don't actually know, we don't really know what happened with that form field. I think that it was probably just an overlooking and someone not properly QAing before they went live. But this is just a reminder that our forms can have emotional consequences. All right, so another way we can help prevent errors is to leave select list blank. So static values are easy to skip, and if you're pre-filling one, your users will leave it there. You can pre-fill the value if you think users will select it 90% of the time, but that number really needs to be based on research. Smart fields are okay, which is an example is if you use geolocation on an IP to um, basically pre-fill a country field box, like in the example behind me. Okay, and sometimes it is important to show help text or explanations or maybe an example. And in that case, you wanna put your help text underneath your input box. 
Okay, and our last guiding principle is to make it human. Now remember, this can be the first interaction that this user is having with your brand, so it's important to make it as relatable as possible. So form text should be written clearly and explain what's going on in a way that that person is gonna understand. Clear, simple language, and call to actions. And I would actually even take it a step further if I could have edited this slide and say specific based on what I learned from Joanna, Joanna this morning. I liked this example because from Burton Snowboards, it said, I'm interested in gear for men, women, and kids when I was signing up for their emails. This is a really friendly way to ask a question that's gonna be critical for all future marketing efforts. Okay, we also wanna limit typing. We don't wanna ever make people work harder than they need to. And we need to make our forms accessible. So web accessibility refers to the inclusive practice of preventing barriers that limit access to or interaction with websites by those with disabilities. And when sites are correctly designed and developed, then all users have access to all information. Woohoo! This is great news! Yes, and if by not having an accessible site, or in this case, form, you could be potentially disqualifying or unintentionally leaving out a portion of the population that you don't mean to be. And the thing is, is that accessible sites are better for everyone. You'll notice that a ramp is not only used by someone in a wheelchair, but also by parents of a stroller, or people who just prefer to not take the stairs. Okay, and we need to also make sure that we value our users' time and ask only if we need to and make each question as engaging as you can. Um, I consider this like if you're asking your friends to help you move, you always have to have pizza and beer. This is valuing their time. <laughs> In this example, this was before I redesigned Duke's giving form, online giving form. They were previously answering, asking these questions and we learned that no, we don't need to, so we were able to take them out. And we wanna consider the context. So I need you to think and ask yourself, what physical and mental environment is someone gonna be in when they get to this form? Are they gonna be kinda bored at work one day and a little bit overworked and tired and just wanna see your demo? Or have they just gotten in a car accident and needing to submit their claim via their online uh, insurance app? Situations matter, and I encourage you to actually visualize someone as they're gonna be approaching this. Okay, so we have a couple minutes left, and I just wanna cover a uh, couple common questions that I often get from people. So people say, Julie, the shorter the better, right? I say, no, not necessarily. Um, it's actually way more important to have engaging contextual fields than any sort of rule about global length being shorter or longer. Optional versus required. Well, don't over-require, because once again, that's not human. And secondly, we want to mark optional fields, not required ones. This is because it's less visually distracting, and it's more friendly. And it's also better for accessibility. This is, we know that this is, can be read by all users. And also, we cannot assume that an asterisk is gonna be understood as required for all users. Okay, all right, quick moment for some examples. Feel free to yell out. Oh. Woo, these are all required. I'm really distracted by all these red asterisks. Um, woo, horrible, yuck. I go to enter this location. It says, enter your location, it's in Durham, North Carolina. It says location not found. Wrong, Durham is a real place. And uh, proceed is a horrible text for button copy. This form, the buttons are all out of sequence, looks like a form in a form. I'm getting multiple error messages, I have no idea what they mean. And it's just horribly unorganized. I'm trapped, I'm trapped. This form is not human. You would never trap people in real life, would you? All right, this field, entirely too many select list. The labels are far away from the field values. It's making me do math. <laughs> Horrible. And one thing, because I was worried about time, I cut out, um, but I just want to quickly say, you want you to have your field length match your estimated text size. And so when, in a world of responsive, 
We want to make sure that on desktop, we're not keeping it at 100% because you don't need your zip code field to be this long. Like this person does not need age, to, that select list, to be so wide. So some final thoughts, real quick. You want to reduce cognitive load, help prevent errors, and make it human. And when in doubt, talk or watch, even better, your users. So thank you very much, and I'd love to be around later and talk to anyone about forms um, for Erlang. So thank you. Thank you.